So today we're going to um, be, it's the first in a series learning all about effective collaborations. And um, we're going to start with building teams, forming teams. So um, that's the topic of this first session. And the main objective, the main goal is to help you develop knowledge and skills to form effective interdisciplinary research teams for greater innovation and impact. I wanted to take a few moments and uh, just give a few shout outs and introductions myself. I put the chat away. Um, so I want to definitely thank the uh, Caribou Interactive Interactions Core. Uh, Chris, uh, Jennifer, and Mariana have been instrumental in setting up this workshop series, and I couldn't have pulled it all together without them. So I just wanted to make sure that I gave them a shout out and thank them for their contributions. Um, I also wanted to give a, a shout out to my team at the ICTER Team Science Corps. So here at the Institute for Clinical and Translational Research, um, we have a, a Team Science Corps and my terrific colleagues have been also instrumental in helping me pull things together for the materials for workshops like this. So there's our director, Betsy Rowland, and our program manager, Patrick Kelly, who I believe is on this call. So um, thank you to both of them for uh, all of the knowledge and mentoring they've given me along the way. Let me tell you just a little bit about what we do in the ICTER Team Science Corps so you're familiar with where we're coming from. So the mission is to facilitate high impact team science by developing infrastructure to support interdisciplinary teams. So how do we do that? We do that with four pillars. And uh, the form pillars are team science education, like the workshops that you're participating in now. Um, we have team science interventions. Specifically, our primary intervention right now is what we call collaboration planning. It's a 90 minute intervention where Dr. Roland walks a team through a series of questions to essentially establish a, a contract to strategically discuss the different processes and things that a team needs to do in order to set up an effective collaboration. Um, you know, they ask about mission, roles, how are they going to communicate? Um, it's a terrific intervention, um, especially if you're a brand new team, but can also be used for ongoing teams that are looking to, to step up their game and really organize things. Um, we also, as part of our core, do science of team science research. So research to help um, ensure that we are helping teams to be as effective as they can. And this all contributes to a culture of team science, so a culture of collaboration. So specifically after this workshop, um, you should be, uh, if all goes well, uh, you will be better prepared to leverage interdisciplinary collaborations to generate more innovative research, to engage and motivate prospective collaborators by clarifying your team's purpose and goals, and then to create maximum research impact by strategically selecting team members and assembling effective expert teams. So I'd like to start with just briefly, just some ground rules, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, so here of them are some of them are housekeeping. Um, so as we saw earlier, please keep your microphones off if you're not speaking. Um, I do like it if you have your videos on. I feel like it generates more of a sense of community, but I completely understand sometimes we have issues with bandwidth. You might want to take a few bites of your lunch. Um, that's all fine. Uh, but again, it just helps if you can see each other. Um, it helps to stay focused and avoid distractions like email, um, you know, texting, email, those kinds of things. Uh, making sure that the floor is available uh, for everyone so that everyone can participate and that no one individual dominates. And I'd like to say that um, I can't tell just from names from the participants, but I do know that when people registered and filled out the needs assessment, that we had a very diverse potential pool of participants. So just be mindful, we'll have postdocs, uh, faculty, staff, and so they're going to be people in a number of different roles. So just to make sure that you can learn from everyone and that everyone has an opportunity to speak, um, even if they're not a senior representative. Uh, I'd like to have us honor confidentiality. So I like to say share lessons, not stories. So hopefully in your breakout rooms and maybe even in the larger room, you will be sharing examples of things that are about building teams. Those examples should stay here in this room. Um, but what you learn, the lessons you learn from those examples, please feel free to share those with other people. Um, if you have critiques, make sure you critique ideas and not people. Uh, I'm totally open if you need to take care of yourself and 
take a, a brief break and take a moment. Um, we will have two breakout rooms uh, during this session, but um, if you need a quick camera break, whatever, just make sure you honor your needs. And um, I think we'll all be uh, good to go. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the ground rules or any comments, concerns? I'd like to give people an opportunity to voice if they wanna add anything. I'm not seeing any raised hands. Feel free to jump in later on if you'd like. Okay, so let's jump into the material. So what is team science? Um, I like to go ahead and talk about the definition of team science because sometimes people get a little bit confused about what it is. So I'll read the definition and then highlight some points. Team science is a collaborative effort to address a scientific challenge that leverages the strengths and expertise of professionals trained in different fields in an interdependent fashion. And so Sometimes people get confused. Team science isn't necessarily one lab collaborating together. Um, you do need at least two people to make it a team, um, but it can also be hundreds of people. Uh, part of the definition is that you have people from different disciplines. So it's not team science if they're not, not technically team science, if, they're not, if you're not interdisciplinary from different disciplines. And the notion of being interdependent is really important because what we're talking about in collaborations is essentially the co-creation of knowledge and the co-creation of processes and understandings of your teammates. So these are inherent in team science initiatives and in uh, effective collaborations. Um, here at ICTER, we work primarily with translational teams. So um, teams that take basic research and turn it into uh, uh, interventions and treatments for individuals. But I would argue that what I'm going to share with you today will be helpful for any collaborative team. Team science allows for greater impact, innovation, productivity, and reproducibility. And we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into that now. So again, some people ask, actually I had a friend of mine, I told him, hey, I'm a scientist for the Team Science Corps. And, he's, and so I told him all about how awesome it is to collaborate. And he's like, what if it's easier to do it by yourself? And I laughed and I thought, okay, that's actually a really, really good question. So I think it's really important to talk about, talk about why people wanna collaborate. Why, why do team science? And you can see from the list on the slide here that it's, it, it makes you better able to address complex health problems, complex problems in general, but it, for most of us right now, complex health problems. Um, there absolutely are times where probably it is better or faster uh, to do an individual project. Um, but if you want to tackle those really, really complicated problems, you're going to need more than one person to do that most of the time. It allows you to pool intellectual expertise so you can integrate experts from diverse areas and think about things in a way that you've never thought about them. Um, again, that co-creation, that generation of ideas that you can't get just by yourself. Um, and it also helps you pool essential resources. And that could be databases, expensive imaging equipment, sequencers. There's just a lot you can do together when you pool your resources that you can't do alone. The research tells us that collaborators, collaborative projects are more productive and impactful. The most of the research that tells us that right now has to do with publications and, and patents and, and funding. So uh, we know that people who do collaborative projects publish more, those publications are cited more often, um, they have more patents, those patents are referenced more often, um, they have greater innovation, they're better able at problem solving, and also relevant to scientists is uh, they, they help enhance reproducibility, which we know is it's always been important that we have projects that are reproducible, but especially given the uh, problems that we've had um, in the last, say, five to 10 years um, of projects that weren't reproducible, that had patient implications, we know how important it is that we be able to replicate our results and our methods. 
Um, and bottom line, uh, at least for many people, collaborating is just a lot more fun. You'll notice that of all of the things that you talked about, many of those things are common to teams in general. So in 2015, the National Research Council sat down and did a huge literature review and assessed teams in general. And they found out that teams overall, collaborative teams, team science, uh, had about seven common problems um, that were most difficult for them. And uh, I'll just start at the top uh, and some of them sort of overlap with each other, but um, having highly diverse teams. And I think, uh, is, it, is it Petra or Petra? Um, I, I hope I'm saying your name. Petra. Petra, okay, I've known both, so I wasn't sure. Um, uh, thank you. So Petra brought up, uh, you know, needing to speak that common language and trying to get your team members to communicate with each other when you come from wildly diverse or even slightly diverse disciplines um, can be a problem. That can lead to a difficulty in this deep knowledge integration that you need to create that something new, that co-production. Obviously, this is magnified if you have larger teams. Um, it's a little easier if you're sitting side by side with somebody and just say, hey, I didn't understand what you said versus you know, a team of 20 or a whole consortium. I, uh, moving on to a different idea, which is the next one on the list is goal misalignment. And so having teams uh, and team members with different goals can definitely create conflict and require management. And this can be something like in terms of uh, intellectual ideologies where you might have um, one scientist proposing a theory and another scientist proposing another theory. It can also be more practical things. So imagine, you know, especially early career investigators, um, publication is important. Um, that may be more important to them than say, um, getting the, the, um, uh, the tool or the cure or the treatment out into the world. Uh, so just having some of those different needs as a team member um, it can be problematic and something to, uh, that you have to, to have to deal with. Uh, all science teams have to deal with permeable boundaries, whether it's graduate students and postdocs or um, especially translational teams move through these different stages. You start with basic research, that basic research uh, um, ultimately becomes some kind of intervention, and then it's disseminated into the world for, um, for use, and you're going to have different people on your teams at those different times. And so every time somebody leaves or joins your team, you have to bring everybody together, get everybody back on the same page. Uh, geographic dispersion is a pretty obvious one. Again, I think we have people from all over the United States right now um, dealing with time differences, cultural differences, um, uh, ethos at a, a specific institution. They might have different ways of doing funding, uh, different ways of organizing things. And then task interdependence is always a tricky thing. Uh, whenever you're waiting for somebody to do something, um, figuring out good processes to uh, make sure that everyone's roles and expectations are set up so that all of the work can move forward smoothly. So these are just the, the, the seven things that were identified and, uh, by the National Research Council. So we've talked a lot. Oh, I'll say one thing. So I did want to share this quote as well. So bringing these things up, uh, science teams rarely fail because of the actual science. So you're all experts in your fields. Um, you're, you're doing the work you're doing uh, for a reason. But many individuals, many scientists are not trained in overcoming all these other things. And I hate the term soft skills, but trained in the leadership skills and the coordination skills, communication skills that you need in order to facilitate an effective collaboration. And so science teams rarely fail because of the science. They fail or falter because of the organizational choices leaders make and the cultures that leaders build. So it's important um, to learn the skills and the practices you need in order to overcome these things. So let's talk about what we do. So we've talked about what's wrong and what we need to worry about. Um, let's talk about what, what our best practices are. So in uh, 2021, uh, Betsy Rowland identified uh, six best practices that either exemplify that a team is functioning effectively or help a team to function more effectively. And I'll go through them here. Um, and before I do that, I did wanna say, 
We will be covering all six of these uh, throughout the course of the workshop series, but we won't be covering all of them in detail today. So we will dive deeply into all of them, um, but today we're only going to touch on the first, the first one in particular. But I wanna plant that seed so that you can think about it as we develop throughout the workshop series. So the first one is to develop a shared mission, vision, and goals, and to get your team uh, aligned behind them. Uh, to build a culture of trust, accountability, openness, inclusivity, and constant learning. Um, you could use the phrase psychological safety. Uh, the next workshop uh, in April will actually be a whole session on psychological safety, building trust, inclusion, um, facilitating interdisciplinary conversations. Here it says about approaches, methods, and results. Uh, but it's basically having those conversations so that all of your team members have uh, a shared understanding of how things work and how to move forward. I'm gonna lump the next two together. So build strong research support systems and build accessible transparent data management systems. So these are the kinds of things that you want to have in place uh, so that your team can focus on the actual work. So these are the coordination systems, the communication systems, that if you set them up well, then you can focus more on the research and less about the, the awkwardnesses and difficulties in coordination. And then we bring all of this together uh, through strong functional leadership. So we're gonna talk about building a team. So let's move on to team composition and assembly. So probably the most important thing you need to do is to identify your team mission and goals. Now, it's not really important what you call that. We could, uh, people in fact do argue about what's a vision, what's a mission, um, what's your purpose. So I think as long as you know your overarching goal for your team, your primary mission, um, you should be set. And then having a clear idea of what your goals are so that you know what you need for that team. And I know that teams, uh, Teams are in a various state. Sometimes people come together and they decide these things together. Sometimes it's one person who has some great ideas and then goes and looks for other people. There's more than one way to do that, but putting mission and goals front and center is important. Once you do that, you need to determine what your required resources are and who you need to have on your team in terms of expertise. You can't do the work if you don't have the knowledge and the skills in order to do the work. And then, it's time to strategically select your team members. Once you have your team members, you clearly define your roles and responsibilities of those team members. So we're gonna dive a little more deeply into some of these things, but these are sort of the, the steps. If you're like, okay, how do I build a team? This would be the very beginning of that. So in addition to the expertise, you also need to be able to identify what makes an effective collaborator. And I think, I think I heard some of your comments sort of touched on some of these things that just because somebody is amazing and famous in their, their discipline or they're, they're an expert, they're the expert, doesn't necessarily mean that that person is going to be a good team member and that that person is going to help you propel your work forward. So at this point, I wanted to take a moment and have you think about the collaborations that you're working on, the collaborations that you have worked on that have gone particularly well. And take a moment and think about what was it that those collaborators, those individuals brought to the table, brought to your meetings that made them particularly effective. And then once you get one or two of those, if you could throw those in the chat, that would be great. So you're, ask, I'm sorry, you're asking for the attributes of a good collaborator? Yes, thank you, Chris. That's a good, yes, the attributes of a collaborator. So what is it, what do those people bring to the table? So we have common goals. Open communication. Open and honest communication. Resources, okay. Respect. A ton of specific knowledge, but friendly and approachable. Enthusiasm. Okay. All right, so I'm seeing some themes. 
uh, organized, responsible, complementary skills, engagement, So if I were to call out a couple of themes that I see, one I see is that um, that they're interested in collaborating. And I know that may seem super, very simple, but I'm seeing responsive, engaged, enthusiastic. So somebody who wants to be there and wants to really participate in the project. Um, I'm hearing open communication, um, that they wanna bring things to the table, uh, resources, specific knowledge and they have common goals and you have things in common or you're interested in similar things. Those are terrific. That's absolutely characteristics of an effective collaborator. So uh, Dr. Roland has asked people this before. And so here's some of the data that we have collected that she has collected um, in uh, previous workshops. And you'll notice that other people, other scientists feel similarly to you. So they want good communicators, people who speak up, people who share credit, people who are reliable, transparent. Again, I'm hearing echoes to the things that you had put into the chat. Uh, they reflect on their own work and the team's progress to improve. They ask for help and offer help. They understand how everybody's work contributes to the project. They address conflict. They share information, again, going back to transparent. Um, they're respectful. I know one of you called that out specifically. They want to integrate their work. They want to be part of that team. They are responsible. They show up on time. They define terms and jargon, treats everyone um, as a collaborator. Uh, they're focused on the goals and more about transparency. So when you're going to build your teams or as you move forward and integrate new team members into your current ongoing teams, I would think about which of these are the most important for you. So maybe think about, you could make, you could have a list of 10 to 15, but I think sometimes um, it's helpful to maybe limit it to say like five. If you could take the five things that are the most important or the top three things that are most important. Um, and just be mindful of those. Always have those available to you uh, when you go out and integrate and interact in the world that that can help you identify really good collaborators to make your projects more effective. I saw Petra said responsible to critiques. Absolutely. Accepting feedback is very important. So how do you find these team members? So we know, so now you know the expertise you need and you know what your good collaborator looks like. How do we define these team? How do we find these team members? So I include this slide um, uh, because uh, it's sort of the textbook approach for identifying team members. I'm not sure it's necessarily the most effective approach, but I put it out there to be thorough and to make sure you have this information. They do in fact have, I like to call them, I guess, matchmaking uh, services out there for people who are looking for specific kinds of collaboration. And along the um, side there with the hexagons or whatever shape that is, um, there are links there to some of the most commonly cited uh, matchmaking sites where you can go in and say, I need somebody who does uh, genetics and um, it's going to hook you up with someone who has the expertise that you're looking for, but it isn't necessarily going to tell you whether or not they're a good collaborator. So just, just so you know. Um, so instead, let's go ahead and jump ahead to the next slide because um, we'll touch up on these other two bullet points later. Instead, um, I think researchers are much more likely to do these things organically. So I don't know if you, it's, it's hard, if you were in a room with me right now and we were all in person, I'd be like, who would be inclined to check out these matchmaking sites? And I'd be curious to see how many people would raise their hands. Um, what I've heard from other scientists is they, again, they take this more organic approach. So what they do is they attend, they network, they attend workshops, conferences, seminars, and they do it with this sort of interviewing lens. And this is where having those top of those uh, collaborating characteristics top of mind makes it easier. So the next time you're at a conference and you show up at a poster session that you know what you're looking for when you're just chatting with somebody about their cool poster. Um, and so some of the questions you can ask yourself above and beyond, is this work interesting? Does it contribute? Uh, does it have the, the knowledge and the expertise I need? Is when you're talking to that person, 
um, do they have experience collaborating? Again, it doesn't mean you can't collaborate them because somebody has to start, everybody has to start somewhere. Um, but are they good collaborators? Do they have a track record of collaborating? Um, are they, in, if they were new, are they interested in collaborating? Again, going back to the things you said in the chat, engagement, enthusiasm, being into it. That's my language, not yours. Um, and then think about when they're in a presentation. Uh, how do they discuss collaborations or authorship? So even if you don't get a chance to talk to them, but you're sitting and listening to a talk, do they call out the team members on their slide? Do they, when they give the references, are their team members uh, of various levels and degrees um, included in the authorship? Those are usually pretty good signs that those people are pretty good collaborators, or at least they do it a lot. And then often, if you can get the icing on the cake, if they tell really great stories in their, their presentations about the work they're doing together, oh, hey, I reached out to this colleague and then we started talking and, um, and they tell these great stories about the work they did together, that's also a good indicator that they may be a good collaborator. Now there's one, um, there's one caveat here, because somebody brought this to my attention, is that if you're looking for interdisciplinary teams, you have to maybe find fora that are outside the fora that you normally attend. So if you're looking for collaborators in say urology and you're attending a urology meeting, that's perfect. If you're looking for informaticians or geneticists or pathologists, or I could throw out a number of different things, you might have to look around to see if there are other meetings or seminars that you could attend. It's probably easiest to do that at your own university. You know, scroll through the events site and just see if there's any seminars or things that are interesting, or maybe reach out to people in those departments and ask them if there are people giving talks um, or if there are people doing the topic, the expertise that you're looking for. I think I'll pause for just a second and just see if anybody has any questions so far. I have a question. Yeah. So you you started this section by saying the team composition and assembly. Yes. So and how you start with your mission and goals, and then yeah. you identify the skills and the knowledge you need. So is this something that should be like written, like written up? Um. I. You know, actually, yes. So in that collaboration planning, um, document. Well, okay. So let me. I'm hearing a couple different options there. So I'm imagining if you're an individual researcher and um, you're starting on building a team, absolutely for yourself, I would document that. I think that having that written down will help you be mindful of it and keep it top of mind. Um, if you have an ongoing team, then I would absolutely include these things in your collaboration planning, whether you do our intervention, which is you know, working you through uh, creating an actual collaboration plan, or you simply document it on your own. Absolutely. I think you should document it. Um, it keeps it top of mind. Like I said, it also makes, um, it deals with that permeable boundaries issue. So you can also use it for onboarding. So, um, what, you know, if you have new people join your team, instead of having to reinvent the wheel, you can have these documents that they can check out and then you can talk through them. Hey, here's our mission. Here's the current staff, uh, current team members, roles and responsibilities. Um, you could have, you know, like I had ground rules at the beginning of the, of the session. You can have something like that. These are our team ground mm -hmm. rules. And this is what we expect from you. Doing something like that can also help build the right kind of culture. For your team so that may be more than what you wanted to know but hopefully that addressed your question no i was wondering if it's like a contract that you actually yeah. do with the people on your team or absolutely absolutely the more documentation you can do it sets a better a stronger foundation for your team thank you for the question that was a terrific question Now let's think about other people you need on your team. Um, so uh, if you're doing some kind of intervention or community-based work, absolutely you wanna have community partners on your team. Uh, I argue that if you can afford it, and I know I heard talk of money, if you can afford it and have a program manager, a project assistant, a research clinical coordinator, it doesn't really matter what you call it, but if you can have somebody on your team who can help you manage the day-to-day, uh, that can 
absolutely be hugely beneficial. Like you said, you're all looking for time and um, you are, uh, if you can find that role, it would be terrific. Uh, the reference that's here is actually from a paper from Sutton et al. And I believe there's some of you from Duke, I believe um, it's from Duke University at their CTSA, their uh, like the ICTER, or like our ICTER award. The, they actually have a pool of, uh, I think they call them project leads or program leads. And they're, they're available to scientists and teams in the, uh, within the CTSA. And so a, a lot of times when you're, when you're writing grants and putting in funding, sometimes you just don't have it in the budget to pay an entire project manager, but maybe you have 25% or 50%. So they have this terrific model there where um, you can hire out for the percent you need and it's like a shared service. Um, so I don't know everybody else, what, but it's such a terrific way to um, do it. So there's a couple uh, comments in the chat that I'd like to, so I think there are two ways teams start. We have conversations and start seeing opportunities or you have a project idea and look for people. Yes, that's absolutely true. And the project managers are really helpful. Excellent. Um, Frederica, are you from Duke? I know we listed everything. Are you, oh, oh, okay, excellent. That's so wonderful that we actually have a representative here to talk about that, excellent. I. It's also good to consider if you want research administrators as part of your team. When I worked in a different position uh, for the Department of Biostatistics, I was a research administrator. And because of my background in science that I often did, I didn't do the science with them, but I often met with the teams at least occasionally to help them keep their, their uh, grants on track and manage their resources and help write progress reports and things like that. So you can decide whether or not you want a grants manager or a research administrator is at least a, a part-time member of the team. Okay. Any questions or comments before we dive into diversity? Okay. So again, what we're thinking about is who we need to have on our team and going beyond just the expertise. And what we know is that diverse teams are generally more effective teams. They're more productive, they're more innovative, uh, they're more impactful, um, and diversity can come in a number of different forms. So here's just some of the, some criteria or some variables that you could, uh, have diversity of on your team. So there can be dis disciplinary diversity. I have like biologists, epidemiologists, statisticians, that's that differing expertise, professional. So that could be industry partners, academic partners, community members, career stage, you know, uh, graduate student, postdocs, senior faculty, uh, demographic diversity, race, ethnicity, gender, age, and then there's all those other things that make us different personality types, work style. So, you know, introvert, extrovert, um, task oriented, relationship oriented, big picture, details in the weeds. Um, so just knowing there's a number of different ways that your team members can vary. And again, the research shows that the more diverse team, the more diverse your team is, that the more creative and innovative it will be. And the reason for that is that what you're really looking for is, um, here, we'll come back to that. Uh, let's see, sorry, a little out of control. Okay, what you're really looking for is cognitive diversity. So cognitive diversity refers to differences in perspective or information processing styles. It's how individuals engage with uncertain or complex situations. So bottom line, you're looking for people who think differently. And that could be for any of those differences that I had in the list. It could be because uh, a brand new uh, early career fac or faculty member has some great new innovative ideas. It could be experience from the senior person. It could be based on cultural differences. But what you're looking for are those, just the differences in the way people think. Because that's by, by being open to those ideas, to hearing those perspectives, that's what's going to get you to spark new ideas and create new things. Um, I, it does take some effort. So it's less visible. Some of those things on the list were obvious. You, you can just look at somebody and know that they're different, but most of them are the kind of thing where you 
have to get to know them and you have to invest a certain amount of time. And so this figure here is actually taken, I adapted it from one from Catherine Phillips in 2014. And what we're showing is diverse teams in blue and homogenous teams in red. And what we're, uh, we're measuring, I put in there productivity, innovation, problem solving. And um, what you'll notice and what research is telling us is that the diverse teams uh, don't perform as well as the homogenous teams at first. And again, you have to think about that. It's, it's both our pro and our con. The diversity brings differences. The differences bring creativity and innovation, but they also just bring those differences. And you have to figure out how to have the conversations so that you can capitalize on those differences and really um, leverage them to do the wonderful things you want to do on your team. And so I like this graphic because it shows you that um, ultimately the diverse teams outperform the homogenous teams, but it does take that initial investment, but it will give you return on your investment. If you are approaching uh, a potential collaborator and uh, I, one, this is just sort of, some people are like, well, how do I do that? Especially if you're particularly introverted knowing that you have a little bit of a script could be helpful. Um, so if you even just say, hey, uh, I'm studying uh, X, this is my mission, my goals. Um, and then ask them if they see that there's a way for them to contribute. Sometimes that's a good way to identify whether or not they're good collaborators because it gets them to think outside, not just of, oh, I know I'll, this is my area of expertise, but they can think about, oh, this is how I see myself in your project. Um, ask them what they need to succeed because you wanna make sure that it's successful for them as well. And you don't have to give them everything they ask for, but you want to set them up for success. Thinking about actually more formally interviewing, um, you, can, you can do it formally, sit down and actually interview people to be on your team and ask these questions that I'll go through in just a second. Or you can even just identify questions that you know, you know, like I said, at the top of mind, um, you know, the top five good collaborators characteristics, you might have two or three questions that you finally land on that, like, if I ask this question, it always tells me if that's the right collaborator. So in the NIH field guide, which there will be a link in the slides, uh, they do have actual questions and there's three different kinds. There's performance-based questions, which are questions about, can the person do the work? Um, you're a data, you're a, um, a data scientist. Can, do you know how to do those algorithms? That's what we need for our team. There are values-based questions. Do they have the same values for your team? So um, do they value accountability the same way uh, that you do? Um, do they value culture? Uh, uh, hearing everybody's voice, all those things, like do they have the same kinds of values? And that can often be important in establishing whether or not someone's a good collaborator or not. Um, and then asking them how they actually react to situations um, can sometimes pull out things that you might not normally see. You know, um, you can create scenarios that say things like, you've made a huge mistake and you have to talk to your team about it. Like, how do you approach that? That's a situation where learning about how someone handles a mistake could be very telling about what kind of person they're going to be and how they're going to handle things on your team. So again, I know I'm running out of time a little bit, uh, but those questions are available and they list out, I think there's five or six for each category and you are welcome uh, to use those questions if they are helpful to you. I did wanna say just briefly, sometimes people are approached to collaborate. So imagine you're that other person and um, you can ask yourselves questions about the actual collaboration. Uh, so does the collaborator have a good reputation as a collaborator? Is this compatible with the way, is his, management, his or her management style collaborative uh, in the same way I want to be? Um, and can this collaboration achieve the stated goals? Is it gonna work? One of the things that I think is more important is to think about your own career needs. So will it help me achieve my vision? Uh, what will I have to say no to? And how much effort's involved? So just thinking about if you're evaluating whether or not you wanna join another collaboration or not. And then going through your team, yeah, setting up your team step-by-step, step, just to summarize what we've talked about today is clarifying and articulating your mission and goals, determining what roles you need, what does your team need in terms of expertise, in terms of diversity, in terms of any of those other roles we talked about, creating your definition of what's a good collaborator, 
and then being mindful of that. So if, if anything else, I'd say that the main takeaway from this particular session is to be strategic. So whether you use social media, whether you use uh, conferences or word of mouth, the whole notion is to establish your team as strategically as possible. Um, that will help make your team more innovative and more effective. And then strategically evaluate them, uh, your collaborators, in terms of perspectives and priorities. And I will stop there. And I know I ran right up to the right right up to the time. And I I'm happy to stay after for a few minutes if people have questions. But something to think about is you know what's one next step. And then also just to make sure uh, that you should have in your email box right your email inbox right now, a survey for the, the workshop. We're always looking for ways to improve and we're collecting data on the material that we are presenting. So if you could take just even five minutes to fill that out, it should be fairly short. That would be terrific. Um, and then it, I know I'm rushing through and I apologize for, just know that there are other sessions coming up. Um, there's a community of practice session where uh, in two weeks on March 20th, where I, we will have an open discussion about how to build teams. Uh, people can bring in their success stories, their problems, their questions. Um, and I'll also have some case studies to work through. Uh, so you don't have to come with something, but um, it, it's helpful if more people do. And you can drop in any time during the 60 minute session.